Hey everybody, I'm Asian Funk. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm joined by E.M. Gist, uh, a cover artist for Dark Horse, Marvel. Uh, he has worked for titles such as The Stain, Star Wars, Alien vs. Predator, uh, Disney Kingdom's Haunted Mansion, uh, Magic the Gathering, and has worked with clients uh, like DC Comics, Wizards of the Coast, Upper Deck, Boom Studios, and Blizzard Entertainment. Thanks for being here. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. You had a social distancing signing at uh, yeah. <laughs> at a comic place called Nowhere Games and Comics in San Marcos, um, yeah. promoting uh, giant size X Men Phantom X. Uh, can uh -huh. you kind of talk about how this social distancing signing went and what was the how how'd that go? Uh, basically, uh, in the ideal situation, I had a table set up and there was sort of uh, I don't know what you would, uh, for lack of a better term, a cattle shoot that was kind of set up and the the. Uh, collectors fans the <laughs> i don't know uh, would come in and they would have and they would gr they would grab the books they wanted signed cuz i had more books there to sign but yeah specifically promoting the giant size x men phantom x um and they would come in and uh the owner of the store would hand me the book for, uh, so they would stay 6 feet away and he would sort of act as an intermediary mm -hmm. and then i would sign the book and we'd hand it back to him when it got a little bit busy they would they would walk up and hand me the book and then step back uh, to 6 feet and we could still you know converse a little bit and and I'd uh, and I'd sign whatever they wanted me to sign and answer whatever questions they had to answer. So it really wasn't that much different than a regular signing. It's just the big difference was that only ten people were allowed in the store at the time. Oh, okay. And we tried to keep as much of a uh, six feet distance as we could, and everybody wore masks. It was pr it was better than I expected. Honestly, I was there for about two hours, and it was anywhere from steady to busy for all but about maybe. 15 minutes of it. I mean, I was literally talking to someone or signing something for pretty much the entire time, except for about one little 15 minute lull, um, yeah. which oddly enough was, was actually in the middle. You would have thought it would have been at like at the end or something, but no, it was real busy at the beginning. There was a pretty good lineup outside. Um, and then, and then it slowed down about halfway through and then towards the end again, I don't know, maybe people were starting to get off work or something. Uh, yeah. Um, and then people started coming back in again. So uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was, I was pleasantly surprised with the turnout. Um, he, he sold out the stack of books that he had ordered. He has more oh. coming in this week. Um, so yeah, it was, I, I counted it a success. Yeah, it was really, and it was nice. It was nice to get out there and, and chat with the fans. Um, being that all the conventions and everything have been shut down. It was nice to get out there and interact with people. And I was actually on eBay right before this, this interview, looking up, um, some of your Marvel card work. Uh, mm -hmm. I think on the 2019 flare cards. Yep. Um, and I was like, okay, if I, if I, I actually don't own any of your cards. And so I was like, I'm going to get some cause your, your work's actually really amazing. And I was <laughs> like, okay, in my head, I'm like, I can't go for the Wolverine one because that's probably going to be super expensive, right? Like people love Wolverine. And so I'm like, I'm not even going to go for that. And I'm, I'm looking and the Wolverine card is actually like, the one of the more affordable ones yeah it's fairly then, reasonable right but the one that's super expensive is like moon knight yeah it's like going for 80 dollars, which yeah. doesn't make any sense to me i'm just like well i guess i'm not getting that one i'm gonna get the one i actually really wanted so i was really glad that i could get the wolverine <laughs> one because that's like one of the coolest um i think uh illustrations of wolverine i've ever seen like just him coming out of oh, the awesome. shadows Thank you. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the concept for that and, um, you know, how, how, how any challenges uh, in, in painting that? So um, I don't know how much you've looked around at my work, but I have something of a, I call it a gimmick. Um, other people call it a, a signature style, um, but it's sort of a figure emerging out of the blackness. It's one of those things that that when it feels right or when I'm under a really tight deadline or someone says, hey, can you have something for us in a week? I go, well, I can do this for you because it's something that's fairly quick. There's not an environment. You know, a lot of the figures lost into shadow. Figure painting is one of my strengths. So that goes fairly quickly. Um, so it's it's a, and plus one of my favorite artists, two of my favorite artists, actually, um, James Bama and J.C. Leindecker were both known for sort of a similar mm -hmm. gimmick. Again, I'll call it a gimmick. Um, so that's where that kind of started. But then also there's the really famous, um, George, Bur uh, uh, not George, uh, uh, burn illustration of Wolverine down in the sewers. Yes. Um, and, that's and the, there, yep. there's the grading casting yep. a shadow on yep. him. Exactly. And so I wanted to do a little bit of an homage to that. And so 
I did a couple sketches and then I realized that, well, if I have his claws casting a shadow across his face, it kind of creates a similar shape pattern mm. as the grading. Yeah. And so that's kind of, that's kind of where it came from. And, and then I sort of locked onto that and I did three or four sketches with that, that in mind. Um, but as far as the challenge now, there wasn't really, it wasn't, that one actually went pretty smoothly. Um, fortunately, because yeah, I mean, everybody's a huge Wolverine fan. Like you said, you know, everybody, everybody likes Wolverine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, when they sent me the list, they sent me a list with about 50 or 60 characters on it and told me to pick the 11 that I wanted to do. And, uh, oh, and he was obviously one of the first ones I picked. Uh, Moon Knight was also right up there. Um, so Moon Knight is also one of my favorites that was on the list. So I, I am happy that that one's popular, but, uh, but yeah, so that was kind of it. But yeah, no, that one actually went pretty smoothly. I had a great uh, model, uh, Yoni Baker, who's one of our local figure models here in town. Mm -hmm. He posed for a good chunk of that set. Uh, most of the muscular male heroes he posed for, and Wolverine was one of them. And with Wolverine, I literally just pretty much put the shoulder pads and mask on him. And Oh, I, I would love to reference. see... Do you, so yeah, I'm interested in your process. Like, so you have a model, and then do you, mm -hmm. you do t do you take photo references of him, and then you paint, or do you have them live as you do it? No, I'd love to be able to paint from life, um, but it's just not practical. But at some point, I may do it just to do it. Um, but no, I've never actually done that for an illustration. Usually, my process is that I'll do a a sketch that's invented because I want to try and get the image that's in my head on paper as much as possible, and not rely on what I can shoot with the model. Mm -hmm. So I'll usually photograph stuff uh, afterwards. So I'll come up with, with a loose sketch. And in this case, it ended up being the only sketch because they came out pretty good. I was pretty happy with them. Um, and they approved them outright. Like, uh, the, they were like, this is like, good, do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She was like, yeah, no, no need to turn in a tighter sketch. These look good. Um, so yeah, go ahead. And so then I hired Yoni or my other models and I photographed them. Um, that was a fairly standard shoot because um, it, it's not anything too crazy like this. My Spider-Man card, if you saw that one, I had to yeah. shoot that one in probably five different pieces. And uh, the model is actually, he's a model, but he's also one of my students or was one of my students at the time. And I, I contorted him as it was, and I still had to shoot it in like five different pieces to, you know, make it Spider-Man. Right, um, right. The Wolverine I was wondering... one was pretty straightforward. I was wondering if you had like somebody hanging by a wire on their waist and then, you know, to get him to, cause you know, he's, he's like inverted. So. Right. The, the funny thing about illustration is that you can use camera tricks. Um, so oh, I was actually yeah. above him. <laughs> and so, oh, but, but put, okay. yeah, so I actually had him pose and then I actually shot. So it's basically, it's, it's the whole thing is inverted. Um, so right, I right, shot right. it as, you know, as if he was above me, but I was actually above him, but then gotcha, you put the gotcha, skyline gotcha. behind him and it, and it works. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's basically just, it's camera tricks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it worked. That, that, yeah, yeah. It ended up working out pretty good. Um, so, uh, so and, and did I answer the question? Was that the question? So no, there wasn't any particular challenges, but yeah, the Wolverine one was a lot of fun and it was, it was just, it was a dream come true to, uh, to get to paint him. So. Yeah, I, I like um, that you called out the you know the fact that because I I didn't realize it till just now, but you do have a lot of characters kind of emerging from the shadows. Um, right. I think I, I would like to call it. It's not a gimmick to me. I think it's more of like an atmospheric decision. Right. Um. But yeah, no, it, it works great. I think for <laughs> and a lot of the characters that you have, you know, like Moon Knight, obviously, is always going to be in the shadows somewhere. Sure. Um. And you know, you do a lot of cre uh, creatures and monsters, and I think that. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Um, it says here that you won the Horror Comics Award for Best Cover in 2012. Yeah. Can you talk about that? I actually tried to look it up and I couldn't find it. So it's, I, it's kind of a, kind of an obscure little award. Um, and uh, I'm trying to remember the exact organization that puts it on, but it's, it's a forum that focuses on uh, horror art and horror comics. And it was a, a fan voted award. I think they've actually changed it now. I don't think it's a fan voted award, but at the time they would nominate in each category, like 10 different, you know, whatever nominees. Yeah. And yeah. then the fans would vote on them. And that year, actually, I think I had two covers nominated. So I was actually competing against myself. Oh, weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think one of them was one of my strain covers. I don't remember which one right off the top of my head, but it was one of my strain covers. And then uh, I also had uh, the one that won, which was a cover of uh, Creepy. 
Uh, I don't even know mm. if Dark Horse is still doing it, but for a while, Dark Horse was was doing creepy and eerie again, and uh, in comic format, not magazine format. Uh, and I did a I did sort of a a Lovecraftian. They that was basically their only description. They're just making something Lovecraft. You know, I was like, okay, cool, I can do that. That'll be fun. Yeah, I like Lovecraft. Um, so I painted it up and it ended up getting nominated uh, for that award along with one of my strain covers. And I think that was the second of three times that I got nominated. I technically, I guess the second and third of four times that I got nominated. Um, uh, someone there evidently liked the strain because they nominated me for a strain cover like three years in a row. Um, but that year I actually got nominated for the creepy one as well. And that's the one that actually won. Um, so yeah. Yeah. That's I think cool. It's, it might be called the, the horror network or something like that horror comics network something like that is is the is the forum so no that's cool i was just like i didn't even know there was i mean of course there's an award for stuff like that i was just like oh that's, <laughs> that's cool um is there so you've done you've done or at least your work has appeared on comic book covers and uh trading cards mm -hmm. um do you usually keep that in mind when you're working on a piece or is is it sometimes where you're told your art's going to be on a card. So do you, do you think a little differently about how you're going to create your work based on the, the size of the format? Or is it just like you, you, you focus on the work and then you leave it up to whoever to resize it? It's, it's first and foremost, it's the work. Um, but certainly you take it into account how, what the reproduction size of something is going to be, because if it's going to be reproduced down the size of a card, you have to make sure uh, I always tell people illustration in general, it's like being a stage actor. It's not like being a movie actor because a movie, act, movie actor, if they want to show subtlety, you know, they do a close up on the face and the actor can do very subtle acting and because their head is the size of, you know, a wall, it comes across, right? And some actors do that very, very well. Um, in illustration, because almost everything you do is going to be reduced, like I always work at least double up, whatever I'm doing, you know, it's like my comic covers, my comic paintings are this size. Oh, so okay. They're, you know, they're pretty big. Oh, um, right. Okay. I think they're 16 by 24. And then they get shrunk down to comic book cover size. Right. So you always kind of have to think about going big or going home. So when you're, when you're doing an illustration of any kind, you have to, that's why I say it's like stage acting, because you have to be able to sell it to the people in the balcony. You have to sell it yeah. to people in the back row, right? Right, right. So you have to be bigger than life. And that only gets emphasized even more with cards. So it's more of a matter of degrees than a matter of philosophy, because my philosophy is always the same. Um, I'm having to re remember that, oh, that's going to be shrunk down this big or this big. And so if I put an expression on someone's face, you have to take that into account how big that expression is going to be. You don't want to, you don't want a, a subtle little, you know, uh, uh, Ryan Reynolds smirk. You want a Jack Nicholson smirk, right? Because yeah. it has to, it has to sell on a head this big, Correct. right? Uh, so it's not a wry little smile. It's it's an over-the-top smirk. Um, so there's no such thing as overacting in illustration, especially in card art, because it, it is, it's going to be so tiny. So you have to think a little bit more about silhouette. You have to think a little bit more about expressions. You have to think a little bit more about details. Um, but it's, again, it's not really so much a difference of philosophy, more a matter of degrees. Mm. When So that's interesting um, that you take into account if, if something will read from a distance. So like sometimes what I usually do is I put something really far away and I just see if, like, if I can still see it and tell what's happening then it's good. Right. right. Um, so like on, on comic books, you know, do you, there's, there's usually trade dressing like the title and the barcode and all that extra stuff that gets put on a comic book. Um, do you take mm -hmm. that into account too? If you know, it's going to be on a comic book, just because you know, the title is going to be huge and it's probably going to be at the, the top third. Do you have to like, move your focus towards the middle and the lower two thirds? Is that something you take into account too? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, overall, you want it to be a strong image to stand by itself, especially in today's day and age, because usually when covers get solicited, they have the virgin covers mm -hmm. um, where, uh, you, know, you know, it gets solicited so there's no title or the title isn't what the final title is going to be. They try to show off the artwork as much as they can. So you can't just ignore those areas, but at the same time, you can't put anything important there. Um, so there's been a few times uh, that I've had an art director uh, tell me, hey, can you uh, bump this down a little bit or can you bump it up a little bit? Because sometimes like the top of a head will fall right at the bottom where the title's going to be. So they're like, well, can we either 
bump that up or zoom in so that it's overlapping the title and we can do a cutout. Oh, I see. Or can you drop it down so that there's a gap between the title and the head? And it just kind of depends. Um, usually every art director is a little bit different. Like some don't mind covering up the title. Uh, some don't want to cover up the title. Some will only want to cover it up in certain ways. Um, so it's just, you know, it's a stylistic thing that you start working on, uh, between you and the designer and the art director or editor, whoever, um, over time you, and then if you work with them a few times, you kind of start to get an idea of what, what they like or don't like. So yeah, it's certainly something you have to take into account. Um, like when you're in the thumbnails, usually leaving those as dead space is a good idea. And then as I start to get into the final rendering, I'll take it into Photoshop and drop the, the uh, dress on top of it and see, oh, okay. make sure there's nothing too funky going on. If there is, then, may, then I'll digitally move stuff around a little bit. Uh, so I've been doing it long enough at this point, and I have a degree in graphic design, so I know enough to be dangerous type of thing. Like I couldn't yeah, do yeah. it myself because that was 20 years ago, but I know enough. Um, and so I kind of try to catch those things ahead of time, but then sometimes they'll come back to me and say, hey, you know, this doesn't really work. Like, for instance, you might have something that has to go behind the title, but then you have the main character in such a way. So you're imagining, okay, the the main character, it's okay that he cuts into the title because they'll just put him in front, but then you realize that something in the foreground would have to also be in front of the title without really thinking about it because you can't put the title in front of a dude's sword who's in the foreground, but then behind yeah. the guy's head that's in the background, right? It starts creating a weird optical illusion. Right. Uh, so those are some things that you have to take into account that sometimes you just don't think about, and then your art director points it out to you because they're good at their job and you have yeah, to make yeah. some cries. Well, I always wondered about that process because there, there are – so many covers where you know the the art uh the cover is so good but then it gets ruined because they put a giant title right on top of something <laughs> important and it kills me every time and it's just like was there no communication between you know uh, like an art director and the the artist was there you know like I, it just and you know like usually if it's like a collage of characters and then they just put this giant logo on top and you're just like <laughs> you know, you don't realize how much information is missing until, like you said, you see the Virgin cover and you're like, there's so much that I missed because <laughs> of this title. And yeah, I, I'm always curious about the, the decision making there. I've been pretty fortunate. Um, I've mostly worked with good designers and good art directors, especially in the last 10, 15 years, once I got established. Um, it, it, I've mostly worked with really good people, but I've seen bad stuff and i've had friends complain about bad stuff but no actually i've been really fortunate in fact um uh they just released the final layout of the next issue of conan that's going to come out and it would be oh cool issue cool. 15 so that's starting back up in october and they released the final design of that and i don't know if it's because of the downtime maybe the designer had more time or he just came up with a good idea but he did a really cool thing with the title um, and the cover is one where it's a down shot of Conan and he's stuck between these two spike oh, walls that are crushing him, right? I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, but keep going, keep going. Well, he actually took the title and put it into perspective. So it's behind Conan, but it's in perspective with the walls. So it's facing up, but it's in perspective with the walls. And, and it's even behind two of the spikes and the spikes are casting shadows onto the title. So he actually put it in world. And it's really cool. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, that's unbelievably awesome. So Nick Russell's the guy. And he, uh, he, he actually laid that out and designed it. And I just fell in love with it because I love that stuff. You know, it's like, the, the, I mean, it's done a million times at this point. But, you know, Hulk holding up the Hulk title and it's yeah, breaking yeah, and yeah, falling yeah. apart. He's being crushed under it. I mean, that gimmick's been done a million times by now. But it's like the first time that was done, someone just lost their mind, right? It was just like, oh, it's so cool. Yeah. You know, so. It was like that when I saw that title. I was just like, oh, unbelievably awesome. Yeah, and I'm I'm totally okay with creative ways of, um, right. you know, uh, putting the title to blend in with the art, right? Like, I'm totally okay with that. And there are even artists that try to put the issue number and the title in the art, too. Right, right. So I'm, I'm all for creative ways like that. Um, and I'm really glad that, that there are you know, designers out there who are thinking about that stuff. And I understand sure. it's not, it's a collaborative effort. It's not just one person making a decision. Um, and I understand there's deadlines and stuff like that, <laughs> but like, it just, you know, it kills me when they just slap on a title and you're just like, you're covering, you know, like 
one of the right. most important parts of this cover. So, um, yeah, <laughs> well, that, the part of that's on the illustrator too, because you, if you, if you stick the designer in a trap, there's certain constraints that they have to work under as well. Like for instance, recognizability, right? I mean, that's why the title's even there yeah. is because the collector comes in, sees it on a shelf and recognizes that as, you know, in this instance, Conan. Well, if you change it too much, you're going to lose that recognizability of the shape of the design title. So it's not even so much that it says Conan, but it's that it's that recognizable yeah. shape or yeah. X-Men. Like what they've been doing on X-Men lately, you know, some people like it, some people don't. But regardless, as, as someone who studied graphic design, it's brilliant. It doesn't even have the title, right? I mean, yeah, it's on there, but you'd have to actually read it to see what it is. But it's got mm. that emblem, that yeah. X emblem that they designed that's on everything X-Men now. And it's instantly recognizable. And also, it's nice because it's small. Yes. And it's just a little medallion. Can, and so right, it doesn't right. take up a lot of cover space. Yeah. So it's, it's brilliant. You actually get the best of both worlds. Um, and again, luckily, it worked out really well with my Phantom X cover because it I kind of left a spot for it and he just, he put it exactly where I was thinking it would go. And it, plus it kind of, kind of mimics the clock face. And there's lots of cool things that worked out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and even picked up on that and mimicked the colors from the clock face in the title. So again, I don't know if that was Nick Russell again, but if it was Nick, good job. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it was, yeah. So there's, again, sometimes you work with good people, but sometimes as an artist, you need to also realize that if you do certain things, you're going to increase the chances of bad things happening because you sort of back them into a corner where they're like, well, it needs to be at the top. So if it's on the shelf, it's sticking up out of the rack and it needs to be legible oh, and it needs, uh -huh. you know, so there's a lot of sales factors that are involved yeah. as well. Um, but luckily most times when I've taken a chance on stuff, the designer has really stepped up and done something really cool. Um, of course, then if you're on a series, it backs you into a corner cause then you have to fit that new format. And I did that actually on a series of book covers, um, that I was supposed to do several of, but because of, one company buying out another company, things changed. So I did the first cover and he designed it where the title went through the sort of the middle of the cover diagonally. And it worked out really wow. cool. It fit my design. It wasn't even what I really had in mind exactly, but it worked out great and it looked really cool. But then when I started working on the second cover, which I actually never saw print because that's when the switchover happened, but I had to keep that in mind because we wanted to keep consistency. Again, it wanted to recognizability, right? So we wanted the right. layout of the cover to be somewhat similar which is why some covers get stale because by the time you get to like the eighth or ninth book in a series it kind of has to fit that same format but the illustrator's running out of compositional ideas to fit yeah, that format yeah. right right <laughs> so, yeah. but anyway so then i had to keep that in mind so i kind of backed myself into a corner that i challenged the designer he stepped up and it threw the challenge back to me like a <laughs> bad tennis game or something right uh, so then all of a sudden i'm going it's like oh crap now i gotta come up with another composition that's different but fits that same format so again, there's lots of things to, to keep in mind when you're, when you're doing that stuff. Um, and if, you, if you're working with a good designer, uh, man, it's heaven. It's like being in a relationship. You, know, you have a good art director, you have a good designer, and you feed off of each other, and you push each other, and you come up with cool stuff. But if you work with someone who's overworked or maybe just not that good or not that experienced, that's when bad things can happen sometimes. Yeah, I, I really uh, enjoyed that, um, that uh, comparison of working with the designer as like being in a relationship. And I, I agree with you. Um, also with the, um, the recognizability of a logo uh, that, you know, most people don't even read the letters, but if it's like in the, in the shape, um, right. they just instantly know. Um, it's funny because there, there's a, uh, there's a Hulk cover that Alex Ross did and it's just, you know, a giant face of the Hulk, but they put, you know, a, a different, um, logo style of the Hulk at the bottom and it doesn't look recognizable, but it's so large that now it makes sense why they made it so big. Cause that used to bother me is that maybe because it's not recognizable, they've had to make it even bigger so that you, right. you, you know what it is. Right. Um, and so th I, those are things I don't really notice as much, but now it makes sense why they make those uh, decisions. Of course, I don't think that's even necessary because if it's a gigantic portrait of the Hulk. Well, right. <laughs> right. Okay. So there's two things already, right? Like you literally did. You don't even have to put anything on the cover. One, it's, you know, there's only one green monster character. That's, you know, you're, you're going to know it's the Hulk one and two, you already know Alex Ross's style. So, right. you know, you don't really have to do too much work, but it just kills. It pains me 
whenever I see stuff like that, where it's like, you don't need to, you know, you could literally just put Hulk like in like tiny letters and people would still know who it was. Right. Um, so yeah. And I'm sure someone in the sales department was like, no, no, they've got to see, right. yeah. you know, Hulk. It's like, yeah. Cause you literally could have put that up as a virgin cover and yeah. it's not like Alex Ross. I mean, his style is iconography. He's not going to do a version of the Hulk that isn't recognizable as totally. the Hulk. It's like yeah. when you see Alex Ross's Hulk, that's the Hulk. Right. And there's no questioning it. Right. So, right. That's yeah. <laughs> and, but you're right. I, I get it from a sales perspective. You're trying to grab the right. people who don't know who that is or doesn't know who Alex Ross is. And I, I understand that. So, right. You know, I used to wrestle with that forever. Like, why would you, why would you uh, deface, you know, something so beautiful? Um, and now I, now I get it. Um, but also you, you leave the title offer, you make it tiny and then sales of that issue are down. It's not going to be the artist who's going to get, get in trouble, especially if it's Alex Ross, it's going to be the sales department. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, it always makes sense now that, you know, there's, there are other people who, who work on these things and not, it's not just an artist and right. the publisher. There's um, a lot of things to consider. Yeah. There's a lot of things at play. Absolutely. Um, so do you mind if I show you some, uh, some images and maybe these are all from your Instagram. Okay. Um, and then you, maybe you can tell me, uh, a backstory to it, any challenges, like if it was a commission or, uh, whatnot. Um, so here's an image that you worked on. I'll show you probably one of, this is probably my second favorite, um, uh, piece that you did of Wolverine, um, <laughs> at the Sentinel. um, and it says that was this a commission? Was that is that on a card? Can you talk about no, that? No, that that was uh that was actually so when I first started doing illustration, so I worked in video games for five years when I got out of college. Mm. Um, and that was great. It was awesome. It allowed me to kind of incubate and grow as an artist without being out there in the public eye. So that was awesome. But then I started but I always wanted to be an illustrator. So I started switching over to be an illustrator, and my two great loves are horror films and comics. So when I wanted to be an illustrator, I decided, oh, well, I'm going to do like almost everyone will say you need at least six good samples for anyone to take you seriously, at least six good samples. And so I thought, OK, I'll do three horror samples and three comic book samples. And that was my that was my plan. And at the time, people thought I was nuts because comics were on the downswing. I, this would have been like 90, let's just say 98. You know, okay. it's like at the, at the bottom of the comic book market, right? Like comics have never been worse. People were like, really? You're trying to do high end comic stuff when there's no high end market for comics. I said, well, it's what I love doing. So that's what I did. Then I did some horror stuff and people are like, are you crazy? Horror, no one does horror illustration. It's all, you know, it was in the age of like seven, right? So it was all that graphic designy paste yeah, up yeah. kind of, you know, uh, serial killer notebook stuff, right? right? right. Um, and I was like, well, horror is what I love. And, you know, I kind of stuck to my guns. And by the time I was any good, horror stuff had changed a little bit. Zombies came in. People wanted to see paintings of zombies. Uh, comic books had kind of bounced back a little bit. And I actually yep. got hired on to do a horror comic. So it worked out for me. But back to your question, uh, that was one of the three comic book samples I did. I did uh, one of uh, Hulk, one of Wolverine, and one of Iron Man. And that's the Wolverine one I did. So that was, that was part of my very first illustration portfolio, uh, like dedicated illustration portfolio. And uh, are you familiar with the illustrator Dan Dos Santos? The name sounds familiar, yeah. So he's a, he's a buddy of uh, mine and Dave Plumbo's. Dave, you had on. Yes. Um, so yeah. I'm buddies with Dave. He actually came out and taught a workshop with us a couple, about two years ago. Oh, that's um, cool. At, at yeah. our school. Dave, so, awesome. so I, know, yeah. I, know, I know Dave pretty well. I've known him for a long, long time. And, and I've known him and Dan both for a real long time. Um, you know, maybe saying we're friends is a little strong because they're over on the East coast and I'm over here on the West coast, but, sure. but, but we know each other well, and we've known each other for a long time. We're very strong acquaintances. I would consider them friends. Strong acquaintances. Um, I like that. Well, so, uh, so, uh, Dave, uh, or I mean, uh, Dan actually owns that piece. Um, oh, oh, I see. He, oh, I, it's with him. Yeah. He, he actually owns it. We traded, uh, pieces, uh, back when I was real, we were both pretty early on. Um, he's a little bit younger than me. And he went right into illustration and has a much bigger name than I do. But we were both pretty early on. He'd been doing, doing illustration for three or four years, maybe. Oh, that's, that's so awesome. And it's funny that you mentioned um, the Iron Man piece. I'm assuming you're talking about this one. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about, so that, that's, one of, that's one of the three uh, yeah. comic book. I see. Yeah. Um, what's the third one? 
the third one is is Hulk, and that one that one doesn't get shown. Um, maybe I'll torture myself and put it up at some point, but uh, it it did not come out as well as the other two. So it, I don't show that one around too much. Really? Oh, yeah. okay. Um, yeah. I, I, <laughs> well, now I'm curious. Right now, is it is it just because? Um, so when you were making those three, was the Hulk mm-hmm. the first one you made, or was it the last one you made out of the three comic ones? Oh, man, it was it was. 20 years ago or, or almost 20 years ago, probably 18 years ago. So I want to say that, that Hulk was in the middle. It was either the first one or the second one. I want to say it was the second one. So I think it was Wolverine, then Hulk, then Iron Man, I believe. Um, with the Wolverine one, I kind of had the benefit of A, having the perfect model who was my teacher, Jeff Watts, who had actually uh, modeled for Wolverine paintings before. Um, Jeff's teacher, Glenn Orbeck, was also a comic illustrator. Um, and he did a painting of the classic like Weapon X with the helmet and the wires hanging off of them. Oh, like, yeah, well, yeah. That, that was also Jeff. Um, so Jeff kind of looks like Wolverine. So I had the oh, perfect convenient. model. <laughs> yeah, it was really convenient. So A, I had the perfect model. B, um, I mean, I've always liked the Hulk, but when I was a kid, X-Men and Spider-Man were my thing. Yep. Uh, that's, I, I didn't miss an issue of anything X-Men or anything Spider-Man. Bought them all up. And so I, I had had this idea for Wolverine since I was probably, whenever I was first exposed to the Sentinels, whenever that was, I'll, I'll say eight because that's when I started collecting X-Men, but it was probably a little bit later than that because Sentinels mm-hmm. weren't super popular at the time. Yeah, 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 90s. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, then I st- so then when Sentinels kind of made a comeback in, um, I thought they were awesome. I've always thought they were super cool. Um, and so that idea had been in my head, like literally since I was a little, little kid. So I had that going for me. I had, you know, whatever, almost 20 years of fantasies built up in my head for that piece. Whereas Hulk, it's like, you know, I I like the Hulk TV show. I like the Hulk cartoons. I bought some of the Hulk comics, depending on who the artist was. Um, but I wasn't like a diehard Hulk fan. Um, Mm -hmm. so I didn't have as many images for that in my head. Um, well, it makes sense also, why you chose Hulk because it's a recognizable character, right? And if you're making this for your portfolio, you want something that people will instantly recognize. Right. And I thought it would fit my style well. And I still do. Yeah. yeah. I still yeah. do. You know, a big anatomical muscly guy, right? Well, yeah. You know, oh, so. Technically a green monster, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so, and I like them a lot more. Like I'm, I'm super into that. The, the series that Alex Ross has been doing the covers for uh, and that Bennett uh, uh, draws it's the immortal Hulk is an amazing series. I collect yeah. that you know, regularly. I read that every month. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm super into that series. Um, but yeah, just to, for whatever reason, when I was a kid, it just didn't really resonate with me. It should have, I don't know why it didn't. Cause I've gone back and read that stuff and I go, why didn't I read this stuff back then? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't really know. I don't really know though why, but yeah, when I got to do it, I, I thought, Oh, you know, let me pick, I think my thinking at the time was I wanted versatility. So I didn't want to pigeonhole myself into just superheroes. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know, the closest thing to a superhero, like like classic idea of a superhero was Wolverine, you know, as far as the spandex tights and all that stuff. Sure. And then I thought, oh, well, I'll take Hulk because that'll show more of a monstrous, big, you know, you know, different character than Wolverine. And then I thought, oh, I'll do Iron Man because that'll show that I can paint tech. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think I, didn't, I think that was my thinking at the time. Right, showing at least a little bit of range, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, that's cool. Um, all right, I want to show you another image here. I can't wait to show you this one. <laughs> yeah. Can you can yeah, you that, talk that, about that? Well, one year at um, a convention called Monster Palooza up in Pasadena, uh, JJ was there with uh, one of his children. I can't remember. I think he has a few children, but he was there mm-hmm. with one of his kids. And, uh, they're, they're into makeup. And so they were there at monster Palooza and they were buying like, uh, makeup effects stuff and prosthetic stuff for his kid. And just because he's a fan in general. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Gary, Gary came running over to my booth. He said, Hey, do you want to meet JJ Abrams? I was like, well, yeah, of course I want to meet JJ Abrams. Who, who wouldn't want to meet JJ Abrams. Right. And so he took me over and introduced me to him and I got to take a picture of it. The funny thing about that picture is the shirt I'm wearing is a BPRD shirt. And oh. I post, so I post, I post that picture on Facebook, right? And Mike Mignola comments on their nice shirt. So I literally got a Facebook comment about my shirt from one of my favorite artists while I'm standing there with one of my favorite directors. So it's just this weird 
Oh, that's awesome. Like, confluence of events that makes that one of my favorite pictures of, of me. Of, I, don't, I, I hate most pictures of me, but uh, that one I love for, for just that total confluence of events. So I, I, That's amazing. I knew there was a story there, and I really wanted to um, find out about that. And you mentioned, you mentioned uh, Guillermo. So there, here, uh, this is the other picture I was going to show you. Right. Um, and it says he opened, you helped him open, uh, a gallery or something. Can you, Oh, it was, there was a, it was a gallery opening. So, uh, I think it was gallery 1988. I want to say, uh, up in, uh, up in LA, up in like the studio city area. And, uh, they had a Guillermo del Toro tribute show. So basically they had a bunch of artists, invited a bunch of artists and said, Hey, paint something that is related to Guillermo del Toro's movies. Um, it, it basically it could be almost anything and there was a few limitations on it but but not too much you basically could paint whatever you wanted yeah yeah uh, as long as it was connected to his movie so i did a painting of uh santi from uh, devil's backbone and oh, okay yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was the opening for that show that specific uh one that was for the gallery show um that picture is actually also from monster palooza and again it was uh gary uh brought uh, Guillermo. That's actually where I originally met Guillermo was at Monster Palooza. One of the first years I did it. Well, that was like, I don't know, six, seven, eight years later. And we'd worked together a few times and he owns several of my pieces now. And oh, nice. uh, Gary, Gary also, when they were walking around the floor, Gary also made sure to bring him by my booth. And so that's where that picture is, is actually at my booth at Monster Palooza. Oh, yeah. Might, even, might have even been the you. same that's, year. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, again, Guillermo and I, I mean, I, again, <sighs> we have an existing relationship. Yeah, so I mean, right, it's right. not like it wasn't real hard. Guillermo knew who I was. And like I said, I think he owns, I don't know the exact count, but I want to say he owns about 13 of my pieces. Um, wow. Because when I worked on the strain, which he wrote with Chuck Hogan, um, I got hired to do the covers for the comic book. And part of the deal was that he had right of first refusal on any of the originals. Um, oh, wow. So he, he bought, I mean, I think I did 30 covers and he bought about a third of them. And then, uh, in fact, if you ever see uh, any of those like news, like fluff pieces that they do where they tour his house that he calls Bleak House. Yeah. And, and it's basically his second house and it's just filled with all of his collectibles. You can frequently see my paintings in the background. Oh, I'm going to have to look that up. So, so yeah. So he That's owns about, cool. I think, 10 pieces from The Strain and then he owns the Santi piece. He also hired me to do a cover for the original novel for uh, Troll Hunters. So before wow. it was the animated series uh, on Netflix, it was a novel. And I was originally hired to do the cover. Well, the publisher balked at the cover I did. And oh. so they it ended up having a different cover, but he actually owns the cover that I did. Oh, he was like, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> well, that, again, that was part of the deal. He hired me to do the cover, and then he owned the cover just as part of the, oh, the I see. fee. So got it, got I got it. paid pretty well to do the cover, and then he got to keep the original. Right. Um, and then I want to say he owns another one of my pieces as well. So, yeah, I think, it's, I think it was 13 is, is the count that I had at one point. So that's, uh, um, that's definitely something I would put on my resume. Like, you know, I have 13 pieces in Guillermo's uh, one of two houses or something like that. That would when, definitely when, when, when I put together a book on my work, which I'll do at some point, um, A, that will definitely be in there, and B, I'll try to get him to write, uh, if not the foreword, to write yes, the blurb for I would just get, so. yep, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, have, have Guillermo do the uh, foreword and have J.J. Abrams write the afterword, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, man. Uh, do you want to, um, we're almost to an hour. Do you want to just um, talk a little bit about your workshop a little bit, and then we'll wrap things up? Yeah. So this is my studio and I've always been really bad about my studio, but I've got an awesome wife. And so she cares a lot about my studio and yep. cares a lot about my work environment. And so um, it's just sort of a corner of our house. It's not even really a studio. We have, uh, it's not quite, where we live isn't quite a, a loft studio type, but, but it's basically two rooms. Mm -hmm. We essentially have our bedroom and then we have the rest of the house. Well, my studio is one corner of the rest of the house, and then hers is right next to it. She's a painter as well. Um, so we both have our studios right next to each other, but I get the corner because she put up these nice shelves for me. Yeah, and yeah. Then, uh, and then I buy all these little maquettes. Um, so basically, if you, see, if you see this lineup of them up here, usually every year at Monster Palooza, I buy at least one. Cause there's a bunch of really awesome sculptors that work in the movie industry. Yeah. And, uh, to, 
as part of their display, they'll do little sculptures and then they'll do castings of them and then they'll sell those there. And they're ridiculously affordable. I mean, like sideshow stuff is cool and it's easily worth the money, but for what you might pay like 200 or 250 bucks for with sideshow, you can basically get something sometimes by sideshow artists <laughs> oh, for really? like 80 bucks. Yeah. Like guys that work for sideshow will have their own little booths there with their own little sculptures and you can get these little like garage kits Oh, you know, just little like little short runs of like 150, 200 sculptures, and you can get one for like 60 bucks, 80 bucks. Huh. Um, so that's a lot of what you see up here on the on the shelves here. Um, I've also got my uh, one of my two lightsabers. Oh, that's there. awesome! Um, so that's actually one of the actual replicas. I got that at uh, Galaxy's Edge, and then I've also oh, got sweet. one of the uh, build your own up here as well, which I can grab. I see you're wearing a Millennium Falcon shirt too. Yeah, I'm a big Star Wars fan, so. Oh, good catch. <laughs> so that's one of the build your own that you can do there where you oh, actually pay awesome. the money and they come out with a kit of a bunch of pieces and you, you put it together yourself. So I did that. Nice. Um, so that, that's a lot. It's just a bunch of nerd stuff mostly. But what color is your lightsaber? Or like what color is the, the actual? Uh, These uh, are actually cool um, because you can actually swap them out. So, oh, nice. You can actually open it up. And it's actually got the kyber crystal in there. Oh, okay. So, so right now nice I've got little... the, the violet crystal in there, but you can actually swap out the crystal and it'll change the color of the blade as well. Oh, okay. I was wondering, I, I haven't done it, so I was wondering how they did that. Yeah, so these ones, these that you, that you the build your own ones, that they, they can do that, which is a really cool feature of the build your own. The ones that, you know, the actual replicas. Um, like that's Luke's, Luke's replica up there. The first, I think it was the first one. So actually, I guess technically Anakin's. Um, so those uh, come with whatever color that they're supposed to be from the movies, right? right? right. You, can't, you can't swap out the crystal, but that's why you can buy these different crystals. Oh, yep. And you put in a different crystal and it changes the color. So, gotcha, so again, gotcha. just, just more nerd stuff. And then uh, let's see, what else do I have up here? Um, uh, my brief adult foray into uh competitive athletics i ran spartan races for a while and oh really okay yeah i nice, got on nice. the old man platform a couple of times so 40 and over so i was one of the top three and 40 and over a couple of times but i don't do that anymore i've gotten too old <laughs> um uh big alien fan so if you can see up there oh, in the corner a yeah. bunch of alien stuff I was wondering if that was like a brood or or yeah or um one of the uh, uh starship trooper uh aliens right right yeah, yeah, all, yeah. The, all the all the alien derivations yes, right because yes. <laughs> i mean i don't think anyone even tries to hide at this point that the brood are basically oh alien. absolutely absolutely <laughs> so uh but yeah so a huge alien fan my favorite movie of all time so i've got a bunch of alien stuff up there um the sideshow collectibles egg alien egg it's all that <laughs> stuff um some anatomical models up there for reference skulls uh i've got my my uh detonator coca-cola thing from star wars land up there oh that's so, so funny those are pretty cool so i hung on to that um over here i've got can you see the marionette up there i can't what what is that so it's a, a marionette that my buddy made for me um i have a bunch of friends that are artists obviously because i'm also an artist so, so there's this marionette here and one year <laughs> we what we did was we all exchanged artwork and we all came up with a D&D &D character. So we basically rolled our D&D &D characters and then we did sort of a secret Santa thing where we didn't know who got our description but then they did artwork on it and then we all traded them at Christmas. So we all got our artwork of our character from that's one of awesome. the other members of our group. So that's my he actually he's a he's a fabulous painter, a Chris Seaman. He's a, he's a wonderful painter. Um, but he actually does, he's also a very good sculptor. And so he made that, uh, made wow. that for me instead of a painting, which is great. And I own a couple of his paintings as well. So I was totally cool. I was super happy to get that because it's, it's really unique. Um, what else do I have? I have some, uh, artwork from some people that I admire. So unfortunately I can't show you Dan's because it, it's big. So, and we don't have a lot of wall space, so I don't have it up on the wall right now, but there's one from uh, John Foster that oh, I traded awesome. for illustrator, John Foster. Uh, what else do I have here? Um, yeah, I've been wondering about that piece for, it, it's just been staring at me this whole time. <laughs> so this is Alan Williams. Um, 
one of the best monster guys out there, if not the best monster guy out there. He's also done a bunch of work for Guillermo. Okay. Um, so he worked yeah, on stuff like very... Pacific Rim and, you know, all totally, that stuff. Yep. So. Yep. Um, so I bought that from Alan one year at Monster Palooza. Um, I love that piece. He actually told me it was based on, so the, uh, I think it was the first season of American Horror Story. And they had that sort of flash of sort of a weird goat chupacabra man thing. You just see sort of a flash of it. Okay. And that image stuck in his head. So he drew sort of just from his imagination what he remembered it looking like. And it's funny because the silhouette is similar, but it's not anything like the one that's in the credits. So it's this really cool thing that his mind just registered the silhouette and sort of that, that huh. brief impact. Then he did his version of it, which is awesome. And so I bought that because I thought it was super great. Um, oh, I see you have the uh, Phantom X uh, right behind you there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so... <laughs> behind me i've got so this is a cover of uh oh, that's cool for uh web of venom wraith that'll be coming out in september oh sweet so very uh tron like the yeah the he's bike. got kind of a tron cycle he's got kind of like yeah basically a space tron cycle basically yeah, yeah. so it's somewhere in between lobo's bike and yeah. a tron cycle mm -hmm. so, and and I love that thing. So I, I actually built a little model of it. I bought a, a little toy motorcycle and and built it out to look like his. So I did oh, a mod cool. on it to shoot mm -hmm. reference. So and then yeah, then there's the yeah that that's pretty sweet. Phantom X cover. Um, so did you actually have your model uh, jump out a window for that one or uh... no? That's actually me. <laughs> <laughs> that was that, that was another one that I shot in like four different pieces because I I, I had like a piece of furniture down in my garage and I stood up on it. And I got in the pose as best I could, and I had a remote shutter release. Ah. And, and so in one picture, I'm holding the remote shutter release, and I'm in the pose as best I can. And then another one, I'm holding a gun with one hand, and I've got the shutter release in the other hand, and then I switch. So oh, I had to shoot God. it in a bunch of different pieces, and then still kind of cobbled it together and, you know, to get what I wanted. In the end, I still went more off of my thumbnail. In fact, on my Instagram, there's a, uh, a video of my uh, procreate sketch so i do a lot of my tight sketches in procreate mm -hmm. and you can see me t actually i have two videos on there one's of me doing the thumbnail which is just all from imagination and then the next one is of in fact i might have even edited it together it might be one video but anyway it starts out just the thumbnail which is all from imagination and then you can start seeing me bring in individual pieces of the reference it's like here's a leg from one piece of reference and i oh, and i, I, I kind of detail right, out the right, leg right. and then i bring in the other leg and i detail out the leg and you see me sort of just slowly bring in individual pieces of reference so um so that's how i did that so that's awesome uh, yeah. i love it. it's like a frankenstein piece i love it basically most of mine are i i rarely i mean unless it's a piece like that wolverine where it's a, a pretty static eye level pose, which I don't do a lot of. Um, but unless it's something like that, it usually ends up being like five or six different pieces of references that, that I use to just fill out my thumbnail. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm going off of mostly that, that invented thumbnail that came out of my imagination. And then I use individual pieces of reference to kind of flesh it out and fix anything that I just couldn't get right in my mind's eye. Mm. That's, yeah, that's cool. Now I'm going to like, I'm never going to look at that cover the same way. I'm going to be like, hey, that's Eric jumping in off the couch. <laughs> it'll, it'll There's a lot of those. That'll just there, be there's forever <laughs> in, like ingrained in my mind. <laughs> Most of my pieces, if, it, if it's not Yoni, it's almost always me. Hmm. Uh, almost always. Hey, I mean, a, a huge, yeah. huge number of my covers are me. That's amazing. I mean, that makes total sense. So now I'm going <laughs> to try and figure out which one is you. Um, I'll just like randomly send you images. Like, is this you? Is this you? Um, <laughs> um, hey, uh, that's th those are all the questions I have, Eric. Um, okay. Where, where can people uh, follow your work um, on social media and stuff? So the best place is uh, is my Instagram. Uh, so that's under EM Gist. Uh, I don't remember exactly how it. I think it might be just E period M period Gist or maybe E underscore M underscore Gist, something like that. Um, I don't remember exactly what it is. Uh, and then there's also another Instagram that I have that you might not be familiar with either. And that's Eric M. Guest. And that one's Eric underscore M underscore Guest. And that, that one's all of my, uh, what are you, more academic stuff. So my teaching okay. stuff, basically. Gotcha. So that's where I post my life drawings, my, my portrait paintings, things like that are on that account. Um, that's for promoting the school, promoting my classes, things like that. And then my illustration stuff again is under EM guest and that's also on Instagram. Those are the two things that I update. I try to post once a day. 
so I quite frankly, I'll get lazy and you, and you might not see a post for a week or so, but, uh, but I try to post every day on both of those accounts. And I've been pretty good about that for the last two months. Um, and then uh, there's my website, which is Eric Guest, Eric with a K, E-R-I-K, uh, G-I-S-T dot com. Instagram's great. Instagram's always, that's sort of my, my main spot where I post regularly and, uh, and you can get in touch with me fairly easily. And I try to respond to most, if not all of the comments. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm much more active on Instagram. So that's, that's the best place. Both my Instagram accounts are, are probably your best place, but again, website, ericguest.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter as well. So, uh, so any of those, if, if, if you, if you pester me enough, I'll get back to you on any of those. So, yeah, man, uh, I really appreciate having you on the channel. Uh, I, I hope to stay in touch and have you on here again. Yeah, great. Anytime. Just let me know. Sounds good. All right, Eric, I'm going to let you go. Um, have a good day and I'll talk to you soon. All right, man. Thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Bye.